Okay, we've been uh, we've been given the thumbs up. So uh, welcome uh, to everybody, and uh, welcome to this event, which will uh, cover the development of country platforms for enhanced climate and development uh, action. So that's an important piece of work uh, by the MDBs over the past year, which takes account of uh, MDB reform work. You know, there's been a lot of discussion on that, and also responds to the calls uh, for MDBs to scale up their climate action and finance. That was an outcome of COP27. So this, in a way, uh, is a kind of a super event, uh, super event in the sense that uh, we have, I believe, eight MDBs that will be uh, talking. We'll have presentations. We'll have lots of content. And I think we have 87 or 86 minutes uh, to do this. So, because of this uh, time element, I will turn immediately uh, by introducing Dr. Zamir Iqbal, who is the Vice President Finance and CFO of the Islamic uh, Development Bank. And among his many responsibilities, Dr. Iqbal has led the inaugural Islamic Development Bank Green Bond and the subsequent Sustainability Bond. I would also like to take this opportunity uh, to acknowledge the important role that the um, Islamic Development Bank has played uh, over the past six months as the coordinator of the MDB group. Uh, and one of the uh, outputs is what we're going to be covering uh, today uh, together. So, Dr. Gibal, lectern is yours. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of Multilateral Development Banks, I'm honored to be here to, today to del deliver the opening remarks on the role of country-led platforms in urgently addressing the challenges posed by climate change. Uh, as you know, climate change is a global threat that requires collective action and coordination among all the stakeholders, especially in the developing countries that are the most vulnerable to its impacts. Country platforms are innovative and effective way of aligning the support of multilateral development banks or MDBs with the national priorities and plans for our partner countries. They provide a platform for dialogue, collaboration and harmonization among the MDBs and other development partners, as well as with the governments, the private sector and the civil society. They aim to deliver more and better development finance while reducing the transaction cost and enhancing ownership and accountability. Country-led platforms can also be key instruments for advancing the global climate agenda and supporting the implementation of Paris Agreement uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals. They help to mobilize and scale up climate finance, promote low carbon and climate resilient development, and foster knowledge sharing innovation. They can also contribute to the global efforts to achieve net zero emission by 2050 and to adopt the changing climate. MDBs are a major provider of climate finance in low and middle income countries. MDBs play a vital role in supporting the development goals of their clients, especially in the context of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and Paris Agreement on Climate Change. However, the current landscape of development and climate finance is complex and fragmented with multiple actors, instruments, and modalities, hence the need for the coordination and harmonization, harmonized coordination mechanism among the MDBs. Now, MDBs, country sector platforms, are not a one-size-fit-all solution, but rather flexible 
and context specific tool that can be adopted to the specific needs and preferences of each country and sector. They can cover a range of sectors and themes such as infrastructure, energy, health, education, agriculture, environment, and social protection. They can also involve different types and levels of collaboration from information sharing and joint analysis to joint programming and financing to joint implementation and monitoring. Today, we will hear from some of the countries they have that have established or are in the process of establishing country platforms. In addition, we will learn from MDBs that, that they have engaged and worked with countries in supporting sub, such platforms. We will learn from the experiences, challenges, and opportunities and explore how we can further enhance the effectiveness and impact of these platforms. We will also discuss how we can strengthen the coordination and collaboration among MDBs and other development partners and how we can leverage the synergies and co co complementarities of our respective mandates. Ladies and gentlemen, country sector platforms are a promising and innovative approach to address the climate crisis at scale and achieve our common vision of a sustainable and prosperous future for all. They are also a concrete and practical way to operationalize the principles and the spirit of Paris Agreement and demonstrate our collective and individual commitment to climate. I invite you all to join us in this endeavor and to share our experiences, insights, and suggestions on what MDB's country platform could look like as well as the success factors. I look forward to a fruitful and constructive discussion with you and to in continue and strengthen collaboration with you in the future. I thank you for your kind participation and my special thanks to distinguished panelists who took the time from their busy schedules to be with us here today for this very important topic. Thank you once again and I look forward to the rich discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Iba. And now we will move to presentations. So two presentations, they will be made in two parts. So the first part will provide a, a brief summary of the joint uh, climate work of the MDBs and results. And it will be presented uh, by Elina Royen, from, uh, who is the Department Director for Operation Support and Climate in the Operations Directorate of the EIB, the European Investment Bank. And in this position, um, you, you know, um, Elina is driving the mainstreaming of green financing in EIB and making it an integral part of its value proposition. So, Elina, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joshua, and uh, let me first uh, start by saying that I'm I'm very excited to be part of uh, part of uh, uh, today's event and uh, represent EIB amongst the the fellow MDBs. Um, so, as Joshua said, uh, in the next few slides, um, we will showcase you the the past before we move on to the present and uh, and uh, dis explain more uh, our initiative on the on the country led platforms uh, let me okay um so where where this where did this where did this all start first of all over the decade ago at the phase of the climate crisis uh the mdbs came together and um uh, had the need to, to share knowledge and uh, and uh, and uh, information amongst each other, um, and in particular, the first uh, work streams that that came live were around tracking and and reporting transparency. Um, and as the work progressed, we welled well beyond knowledge sharing and 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 coordination um, and tracking and reporting. Um, we we worked 
together around the dual challenge of nature and diver in, uh, biodiversity, and that work continues. Uh, we also um, uh, came up with the common principles for Paris alignment, and now we are we're working on the operationalization of those principles. And um, um, of course, we have been working together jointly on efforts to to mobilize more more climate finance and um, on on greening of financial uh, of financial systems, and in particular, focus on mobilizing private capital for for climate. Um, so that brings me to the to the next slide and and some of the 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 quantitative achievements if you if you will um i would like to hear pass on really three key messages first of all we are we have already uh, we are already achieving our uh, joint set climate finance targets ahead of the time uh, and uh, of of 2025 at the same time, uh, we are um, we we are uh, able have been able to mobilize private financing with uh, at the con uh, with the considerable considerable scale. And thirdly, I would like to point out that as we are financing um, uh, the as we are we are financing climate climate mitigation uh, uh, investment, we are also uh, significantly, have been able to significantly to jointly ramp up adaptation financing, which of course remains as a, as a key challenge going, going forward. Um, now I would like to uh, pivot back to the Paris alignment and those Paris alignment uh, principles that we have jointly agreed upon. Um, we have been working uh, along the six building the six building the building blocks um, around the Paris alignment frame. Um, we on on the building block block one and two, the focus has been on on considering the operationalization challenges of the Paris alignment principles at the institutional level. Uh, the, the promotion of transparency and accountability on, on Paris alignment has been high on the agenda. And we have also been considering how we can actually walk the talk, how our institutions themselves can, can align their activities with Paris. Um, and of course, the scaling up of uh, climate finance along the, the, the low carbon pathways um, has, been, has been a top priority. Um, and indeed, helping the countries to develop and enhance their climate policies uh, and support the, the, the systemic implementation of those goals. And that brings me to my final slide and, and a bit of a deep dive on the, on the topic of, uh, of country level action and systemic change. Here, um, the MDBs have, have a track record already in supporting the country level LTC, LTC implementation. And again, I would like to leave you with, with, uh, with three key messages here. First, the actions around the LTC support have been global, as you can, as you can see. At the same time, we have been acting globally. So um, the, the actions have been translated to a very significant number of individual uh, engagements at the, at the local level. And, and, these, and, and then thirdly, these engagements have covered uh, activities from upstream uh, policy work to, uh, to midstream project development and also downstream activities at the, at the project level. And I think this work that we have done really underpins the recognition that there is a need to prompt systemic system change, uh, do collaboration, cooperation and, and partnerships and with that note, I actually would like to hand over to Su Hang, who will, who will now uh, dive deeper into the topic of, of country platforms. So, thank you very much, um, Elina. So, I hope everybody that uh, the reason this little presentation was made was to show what uh, we're building on, you know, what the MDBs are building on that this is not, in a way, what Sunga is going to 
present, you know, is not a de novo, something that's invented, but it's something that builds, you know, on a lot of work. And I think your last slide was particularly illustrative. So Sungha has a very long title, which I need to tell you about. You know, she's the associate director and head of green policy and analytics at the EBRD. As such, she deals with a lot of the issues that were in the last uh, slide. But now we turn to you to uh, hear more about this uh, famous country platform approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have the slides? Yes, the next. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, so, um, last COP in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, it was the first time that the COP decision specifically uh, mentioned MDB, to, uh, calling on them to act. What it asked for is in, uh, MDBs to define a new vision and commensurate uh, operational model, channels, and instruments that will substantially increase climate finance. This um, notion of MDB's role in uh, mobilizing uh, uh, mobilizing finance and not in the billions, but really in the trillions was captured in the independent high level expert group report on uh, finance for climate action, known also as Songwei and Stern report. Uh, and also there have been many subsequent high level announcements, including the G7 and the G20 on how MDB's role is very uh, important uh, in terms of scaling climate finance. Ah, sorry, sorry, I didn't realize I have the clicker here. Um, so uh, to, in response to these uh, calls, um, so MDBs have been working together to develop a new country sector platform, uh, which is shifting from the individual project finance approach to programmatic uh, approach to really um, achieve the systemic and transformational change. Specifically, it aims to first enhance the climate ambition of the country, which provides a strong political commitment and uh, the signal to the market that provides the grounds for the uh, wide, uh, uh, cooperation among the stakeholders. Secondly, it's about uh, accelerating the identification of projects and investment needs. Um, these, uh, this process needs to be informed by various technical assessments, including transition pathways, country diagnostics, uh, analysis of uh, various policy and legal framework, but also active stakeholder engagement. And this uh, identified project uh, and investment needs need to be captured by a country-owned investment and fin uh, financial plan. Third. It aims to mobilize finance uh, from both the public and private sector through improved access to concessional financing and project preparation and implementation support, which then leads to reduction of the transaction costs and cost of capital in general. And last but not least, it's about enhancing the transparency and accountability. And this is through tracking and reporting on measurable uh, uh, progress, including uh, the overall impact of the collaboration and system transformation. So what does it take to develop and implement a country sector platform? First, uh, the country really needs to define the outlines of the platform. This means that the country needs to first be able to connect with its overall climate goals uh, as reflected and captured in the NDC and long-term strategy but also set out the ambitious uh, measurable targets it wants to achieve. It also needs to elaborate the links between climate and development action and its co-benefits. Uh, uh, the platform also needs to outline what is the aggregate climate investment pool. So combine public, private and concessional finance, but the overall ambition, the financial ambition needs to also be outlined and uh, the cross-cutting elements uh, needs to be integrated uh, what I mean by that is, um, for example, just transition, uh, nature, and private sector participation. That needs to be reflected into the output and outcomes uh, that the platform aims to achieve. And uh, MDBs, once that, once, once that outline is sketched out, essentially MDBs can support the country in breathing life into this design by providing the different types of uh, activities, as mentioned before, whether it's technical analysis to mobilization of finance and um, uh, uh, facilitating the uh, stakeholder engagement, um, 
uh, MDBs can either uh, join forces and collaborate in, in carrying out those activities or divide up the role, depending on the con uh, country context, you know, uh, but to deliver in a uh, resource optimal way. What is really essential is, of course, the country ownership, as mentioned. Uh, it goes beyond the ownership. It's about leadership, meaning that the platform needs to weather through the changes of government, uh, which can be quite challenging uh, in the context that MDBs operate in. It's also the country needs to be uh, good, uh, but needs to make the public aware of what the co-benefits of the platform should be. You know, beyond climate action, what is the actual development to tangible benefits that the public can feel? It's about happen making the coordination happen at the country level and defining the range and the roles of the participants uh, who will be part of this platform. And then last but not least, the country needs to aim in parallel to develop the appropriate local capacity so that uh, the platform has more long-term sustainability. Last but not least, I think what is most important is the ultimate impact that we are trying to achieve. Um, kind of illustration of the year of change here, but I mean, what I want to bring your focus to is really the last point is that we, through the platform approach, what we're trying to do is accelerate the transition to Paris aligned country driven just transition into a competitive, resilient future economy for the countries uh, that we are supporting. So on this note, I will pass on to the panel discussion where the panelists can uh, further share uh, some more uh, examples on the different components that they are working on um, uh, and how we can work together. Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Sunga. And I think the reference now, um, to the next part, we will have two panels because of the extent of material that we would like to share with you. It really relates to that little uh, brush with the paints, right? And what we're going to try to do is uh, to go through the color palette, you know, and uh, describe to you the work that is done in some of these different elements. So the first element is one uh, that is very important at the beginning, which is uh, good analytics and understanding you know, what the issues are. Because as you all know, in this room, the issues are not easy, right? And they require you know, a lot of work. So for that, uh, we have Raoul Kitschlu, who is the uh, practice manager in the World Bank Climate Change Group. And in this position, Raoul, if I understand, you lead the team that uh, is, uh, in a way, uh, mainstreaming climate action across the World Bank lending operation. And uh, that's quite a job. Right. So um, I think the question uh, to you is really to ask, you know, how can CCDRs, right? Uh, you can explain what the acronym is for those that don't know, but I'm pretty sure that everybody here knows what they are. But to which extent, you know, uh, are they being used or can they be used to inform country platforms? And how do you work with other MDBs uh, in this process? Rahul. Thank you, Chief. I think uh, a super panel needs a super host. So, Joseph, I think uh, grateful for the invitation. Very nice to see so many new and old uh, friends in the room, uh, especially those of you who braved the long lines in the heat uh, today. Um, and I think uh, uh, what I would start by saying is a transformational impact um, or outcomes on climate and development really need the scale and speed and the urgency that uh, the, the challenge uh, requires. Um, Dr. Iqbal started talking about the fragmentation. I think the time for siloed approaches on, oh, climate and development separately, climate and nature, climate and water, climate and health, we need to put it all together to really have meaningful impact because these issues are so intertwined uh, that you cannot cherry pick uh, on, on issues uh, altogether. I think the partnerships, the platforms, the real value proposition is that aggregation, is that scale mentality, is bringing all of our uh, expertise, our financing behind the countries uh, and to be able to reimagine uh, our approach on the ground uh, uh, in each of these countries that we are operating in. So I think with the goal being very clear that we want to be able to have truly uh, better outcomes uh, on low emission and resilient pathways uh, that support the country's development. 
the question is that you begin that journey with some clear direction, with some clear mapping of where you're ending, what the issues are, what the alternatives are, uh, and, and what type of uh, engagement uh, each one of us uh, uh, can, uh, can support. Uh, so I think uh, I'll talk about three things, what CCDRs are, how do we develop them collaboratively, and what can they be used for? So on the first side, what CCDRs are, is uh, what Sunga very nicely put, is that they are a connection piece between the challenges that are so multifactorial, global and local in nature. Uh, and so we're really trying uh, to, to resolve this uh, from a very rigorous analytical upstream manner uh, to answer questions around what are the impacts and risks to a country for climate change? across its economy, uh, what are the poverty impacts, what are the distributional impacts, what are the impacts to this infrastructure, uh, what happens to its export industry, what happens to communities, health systems uh, in that uh, environment. Uh, those issues perhaps already are difficult to address at a sectoral level, but then to model that across an economy and to look at the trade-offs and interdependencies in that macro setup uh, is really complex exercise, requires a lot of data, requires a lot of, uh, you know, uh, minute understanding of equilibrium uh, computational systems, which uh, uh, has to be developed uh, collaboratively across all of our uh, expertise. I think the same uh, token, uh, looking at the cost and opportunities on, on the decarbonization pathways, uh, whether it's in the energy sector, transport sector, industries, um, how uh, can the country truly achieve net zero pathways um, uh, is something that uh, is uh, at the heart of developing uh, a successful uh, country uh, climate and development report. Uh, we've done about 45 of them and another set uh, of about 15 to 20 are in the works and the goal is to cover basically all of uh, our, our uh, uh, client countries uh, globally. Second part is how do we actually develop them and, and you know, uh, provide the, the right set of tools and options to the country uh, in, in order to look at uh, uh, various policy and investment uh, uh, opportunities uh, that there are. I think in terms of uh, uh, the building blocks uh, of information that goes into this uh, uh, one report, I think the last time that we had done a stock take is about 200 staff of the World Bank work on each single report. Uh, in addition to all of the collaborations with academia, with MDBs, with the country, with the civil society, private sector that uh, are part of this journey. And that collaboration at the input level is multi-dimensional. It can be at data levels, it can be looking at scenarios. Uh, if the country achieves targets here, uh, what are the various uh, uh, different scenarios that can be considered? What are the uh, trade-offs between those scenarios? Uh, we work very closely with IMF on some of the macro data and analysis and the financial system uh, issues uh, that uh, they are working on. Uh, we work with our colleagues who may have expertise in a particular sector, have done rigorous analysis, and that can be used as input into uh, a lot of these uh, tools uh, that are designed. And I think we've seen very successful partnerships at the ground level for, from, uh, from this standpoint, you know, uh, in countries where we have country platforms either already underway or in, in the works of Bangladesh, Egypt, many other countries where it really uh, can provide that uh, collaborative platform. Finally, as I said, what are the outcomes and how this can really be used? The outcomes of the CCDRs can be used to facilitate a greater action and uh, uh, better uh, organization and coordination is that it simply provides uh, uh, not just uh, challenges and opportunities, but recommendations on the policy engagement package that may be uh, necessary to enact a successful ecosystem for public and private sector investments to come in. At the same time, it also identifies investment plans that are necessary, whether it's on the resilience pathways or decarbonization pathways for the country, which is absolutely key for all of us to rally behind as well. It's not only the knowledge and the technical assistance and expertise, but the financing, which sectors should it be directed to, how much is the quantum, and the idea really is to mobilize resources from a, uh, from a wide uh, uh, set of uh, uh, buckets, whether it's domestic resources, uh, MDB resources, 
uh, looking at concessionality, looking at opportunities for repurposing subsidies, carbon markets, concessional resources that may be available. So it's really, you know, uh, the idea is to provide the upstream analytics, help coordinate all of our uh, respective capabilities and rally behind the country in a, uh, in a predictable long-term policy reform and investment platform that uh, is the value proposition for CCBS. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. And I think uh, one very important uh, outcome also of this work is this notion of, of priority because, you know, countries uh, confront a lot of issues. They have to do a lot of very difficult, you know, assessment, trade-off. They can't afford everything. And I think CCDR is also very useful in that, in the sense of giving a sense of that priority. So having this first piece, right, the uh, upstream, let's move to... Uh, Say the, maybe the next color on the palette that you saw, you know, on the slide, which is really, you know, a key element of this platform is really what uh, is sometimes referred to as country ambition or the formulation of the goals. What are the objectives, you know, that are being pursued, you know, by the the platform? And therefore, I'd like to uh, turn to uh, Jean Pierre Onetri, who uh, is the director of sustainable business. Uh, and infrastructure at the uh, EBRD uh, because, you know, he has been uh, working, you know, with a number of countries precisely on that particular question. So, uh, jean if you could uh, share with us a bit, uh, what do you do? How do you use that, uh, how do you say, uh, painting brush? Thank you, Devon. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to share a bit the experience of, uh, of the BRD in this, uh, in this journey. We are at the beginning of a process in developing, supporting countries where we operate, developing and implement this country platform. I'll try also to be a bit specific, you know, give examples. So to give a bit of color to, uh, 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 to the work we're all doing. A lot has been said by Sangha, by Elina, by Rahul. So I'll try to bring some elements of our experience uh, in cooperation with partners, for example, in the development of the uh, supporting Egypt, uh, uh, developing the, uh, their uh, energy pillar in the uh, uh, Nexus Water, Food and Energy last year at the COP. But also the experience we are uh, um, currently uh, um, uh, implementing in the context of uh, uh, the Just Energy Transition platform for North Macedonia. Um, a couple of, uh, of, of elements. Clearly, there is a degree of customization or diversity in all these platforms. At the same time, you can identify common patterns and trends that emerge and are quite clear. The first one I think has been mentioned, country ownership and country leadership. This is key. This requires, of course, strong leaders, the identification of champions within the government and the relevant institutions, but also the ability to build and, uh, and, uh, and develop the existing ecosystem of policies and, uh, and activities happening in the country. Again, I want to be specific. Let's look at the case of Egypt. Uh, last year, together with uh, several partners in this room, we uh, supported the government launch the energy pillar of the Nexus Food, Water uh, that, that, uh, um, and Energy that entailed the closure of fossil fuel assets, the investment in uh, uh, grid development, but also a big component of renewable energy development. Now, all this work was not really starting spontaneously, but ultimately built on, on several years of engagement on, the, on building the renewable energy markets. Uh, together with our partners, we developed the regulation and the standards for uh, supporting renewable energy that led to the uh, 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 implementation of the largest uh, solar PV plants in Africa. There's been work on the hydrogen strategy, low carbon pathways in industries. So all this created a fertile ground and also the language, if you like, to engage with government, local institutions, sector associations, and help developing the uh, 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 the uh, momentum for uh, for uh, for the platform. It's also important to be opportunistic sometimes. You know, in the case of some of these platforms, there are elements that are you know critical to trigger a, a shift in approach and uh, an urgency with uh, with the government institutions. In the case of Egypt, it was the COP. Ultimately, it was a strong impetus to present something meaningful and material at the COP. In the case of North Macedonia, is the possibility to access funding from the Clean Investment, um, the Climate Investment Fund for the supporting the closure of the fossil fuel assets. We are now currently working also uh, in the potential development of the platform for industrial decarbonization in Turkey. There, the, the external internal driver are the uh, emergence of legislation like the CBAM, the EU CBAM that you know, clearly creates strong 
incentives for the local industry to decarbonize, but also very much the high level policy uh, strategy and objective of the country. The country has announced the net zero, net zero uh, uh, objective by 2053. And so these, of course, percolating across all sectors. What is important in this context is also to uh, uh, develop a very strong narrative that combines elements of political economy with you know, strong links to economic development and climate strategy. Uh, we believe that what EBR, um, uh, MDBs can do is really to facilitate this process and coordinate the different parties to come with actionable uh, uh, and, uh, and realistic uh, uh, roadmaps of investments in policy interventions. Uh, maybe uh, uh, one element that we observed in the development and implementation of these, uh, of these platforms is the fact that ultimately it's important to set realistic and achievable objectives that build on a strong assessment of economic, uh, of investment needs and expected outcomes. The theory behind is also that the role of the MDBs in facilitating this process is actually uh, temporary and evolving. So the idea is that once you achieve uh, technological, let's say, convergence on what are the technological solutions that can lead to decarbonization, uh, and also when there is a clarity on the policy signals and the market signals, ultimately the expectation is the private sector takes over and complete the process. And you, 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 we need to work on defining, identifying, and supporting the trigger points that really creates, you know, irreversible shifts in the market. Maybe let me touch briefly upon upon the process. Uh, um, uh, data has been mentioned, the role of uh, analytics, very, very important. Uh, and this, the MDBs can provide the body of knowledge, but it's also important to work on scenario analysis. I think that's what, in our experiences, triggers a lot of, uh, a lot of changes. If you allow me, just a couple of elements on complexity and challenges, because we're talking about all the good stories, but there are also a number of challenges we're facing. One is how to integrate adaptation in this country platform. It's not simple, it's very difficult, and this is something we're working on and we want to do more. The second one is uh, the symmetries in, you know, these platforms are designed for private mobilization, but also to allow the integration of uh, uh, funding, co-finance from donors and from international institutions. And there, there is an issue of asymmetry in expectations and objectives that often are difficult to, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, combine. And maybe the, the final point is also competing uh, uh, objectives at the country level, so the, the idea to create a convergence in, uh, you know, between economic development and climate policy becomes critical for uh, bringing everybody along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean Piero. So I take note of this uh, word asymmetry, which I have to understand better what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, thank you. And so I think for everybody, I hope you see the trick that we're trying to do together, right? The analytics you know, the setting of the goals, you know, directions, you know, what are we trying to achieve through? And now I think I move to the next step that we had, the next color on the on the palette, which is really the notion that Rahul mentioned on uh, investment plans, you know, on investment programs, and very much also back to what Sunga mentioned, which was really at the end of the day, how do we shift, if you want, from an approach that is project by project to an approach which really tries to take a sector, a theme, or sometimes even you know, multi-sector and really try to define the investment program that will support you know, the changes you know, and the transformation that is being pursued. So to cover that very simple topic, not so simple, uh, may invite uh, Seleha Lockwood from the uh, AIIB uh, to cover uh, that uh, uh, topic and sell out just for you to know everything is the senior climate strategy and policy specialist at the AIB. Sell out, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So, um, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, is coming to this topic uh, from a unique perspective because it's uh, our core work is infrastructure. So it's mitigation uh, and adaptation and resilience are really critical in this space and it's both the solution and uh, and uh, the area in which we need to make sure that we're addressing the impacts of uh, climate change um so um i was going to just speak after i thought that we're not going to show my slides but now that the slides i'll go 
go through uh, what um, I, I wanted to say just in three short slides. Uh, one is that uh, we have an approach in which we put a direction on vis-a-vis uh, -vis a climate action plan that was released in September this year. And from that, we've tried to set out certain themes for this COP. And this event really speaks quite significantly to uh, one of the main three pillars. One is strong partnerships, which the other people on the panel have also mentioned. And within that is the importance of mobilization and then it's supporting country, regional, global level platforms, which are country led. Um, and I've circled that in our first pillar there, which comes from the four principles that we have within the climate action plan. And the other core aspect is a holistic approach. So not only looking at mitigation, adaptation and resilience, but also biodiversity in nature. And as Rahul Hul was saying, we need to be thinking about maximizing co-benefits. Um, that is uh, something that we've also emphasized and we continue to focus on. And finally, innovation, both in the financing instruments that we on the on the table when we're discussing with countries as well about what we could do uh, in infrastructure investments, but also in terms of technology. And uh, you, you'll see we have quite a significant focus on that. So we're trying to come to the table with technology solutions. Now here in the uh, uh, what I wanted to bring to the table is a particular example of engagement with a uh, a country which, which we've been trying to do more programmatically, and that's Cambodia. Uh, we have engaged over a year with the investment operations team focused on infrastructure. And it's the country that came back to us with a specific program was prepared uh, by them with three priority areas, not only just one sector, but three different sectors. And out of that, a specific pipeline of projects came through. Um, so that's, uh, as you mentioned on the slide, you can see water transport and urban. And uh, it, what we're doing now is that we are building on that work we've done with a new program on climate resilience. And that is with another development partner. So that's where I wanted to share some final lessons learned we've had. Um, other MDBs have probably maybe worked in this area much more than, than us, but what I've tried to do is make sure that we come with what we are observing with engagement uh, with countries. One is that, again, this is a critical aspect here, it, it's, uh, and it's a, a core point about success of country platforms, it really must be country led and, and owned. Um, and then of course, there's the alignment uh, as well that we can uh, work with uh, countries on, on NDCs, NAPs, long-term strategies. And often we come back constantly to the, the need for policy-based financing for climate. So I see that uh, as a, a important um, aspect, especially with fiscal space uh, being a, a challenge in the current macro uh, scenario. And that's where it's interesting to see right now, as Naida is in the audience uh, from ADB who will uh, point to, there's um, the Bangladesh pavilion. There's actually uh, the uh, Bangladesh country approach being put forward on a principles basis. Um, and they're putting it forward as a, a discussion point. And, and that's where uh, we, we see the importance of uh, the, the country leading um, on um, coordination and setting up a specific structure. Um, they have a project preparation pillar, mobilizing finance pillar, knowledge and capacity building, and also measuring uh, metrics. Um, as well, outcomes. So second is MDBs need to coordinate and collaborate better. And uh, so I just really think this is a critical point. That's why it's in the middle. Because uh, I think that one of the feedbacks that we get from countries is all of us MDBs need to make sure that when we're working together side by side, we also don't overburden countries with 
doubling up on perhaps taking different uh, approaches. Oops, what's happened here? Um, what happened? Okay, um, but different approaches, um, and uh, this is where I think it's it's important that we try to be pragmatic and we work uh, better together amongst the MDBs. So, for instance, us co-financing with other MDBs, accepting that certain standards are done, and then sorry, Joshua, final point, which I think is the only uh, is a very critical point, is countries sharing amongst each other, and us as MDBs facilitating that. And I think it points to a lot of what uh, both uh, Rahul and Jim Perra have said. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Selah. So we continue our trip, but now because the trip is so long, we actually need to change panels, right? So it's almost like changing the engine. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, the panelists. Thank you also, Dr. Ipa, for your introduction. And while I call the next, Members of uh, panel number two, I'll uh, introduce them for you. So over there, right now, he took his glasses off, so things are getting serious, is uh, Graham um, Watkins. And um, Graham works at uh, the Inter-American uh, Development uh, Bank, right? And uh, is the chief of the Climate Change Division. Uh, in the middle, you have uh, Noel O'Brien, who is the director of climate change in the uh, Climate Change and Sustainable Development Department at the Asian Development Bank. And then very close to me is uh, Alam Dorsuma, who is the acting director of the Climate Change and Green Department and manager of the Climate and Green Growth Activity at the African Development Bank. So. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do uh, also in this event was to show you one, I would say, the work that goes under you know, uh, this notion of a platform, but also to show that uh, the concept ought to be a concept that's adaptable to a very broad range of topics, right? And one of the things for those of you who have followed, you know, JetPs, um, you can see that, you know, by definition, a jet P is very much oriented to the energy transition. And one of the points uh, that uh, is tried, you know, the MDBs are working on is essentially to broaden the applicability, you know, of this uh, platform approach to, uh, in a way, a broad set of uh, topics that are essentially embedded, you know, in the climate, you know, in addressing the climate challenge. So um, I will first turn to uh, Noel uh, because you know the I see it was just mentioned by Seleha uh, actually um, the Asian research I think has been working for quite a period now with uh, Bangladesh in particular uh, and I think that provides a very interesting place to understand what a platform approach could do in the context of a country like Bangladesh where. As you all know, the adaptation issues are, you know, very significant. So, Noel, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, can you hear? It? Thanks, Joshua, and thanks uh, for inviting ADB to be part of the panel. Um, let me just to begin by indicating that this event is happening at the same time as a, the event from Bangladesh, uh, where they are presenting their platform. Um, there was a discussion about launching, but it's still at the presentation stage just now. So colleagues are, are with, with that um, effort. So we'll focus in, uh, as Joshua said, on the Bangladesh. So one of the things is the actual context in Bangladesh is that it has the Delta plan up to 2100, but it also has a substantial national adaptation plan up to 2050. So the kind of figures that are indicated for the 2050 is the need for about 240 billion US dollars to deliver that by 2050. But just in today's meeting, they've announced that that would need about, because that rate works out at 6 billion. But in the event happening over there, they've just indicated that they look at that figure now as in the range of about 11 billion dollars per year if they are to make that adaptation effort happen. Uh, so so um, in terms of what's been happening within Bangladesh, there are three uh, policy-based lending initiatives, the World Bank, the IMF, and ADB. 
um, and what's included in one of those policy initiatives is the actual uh, policy instrument for the establishment of Bangladesh's country um, uh, climate and development platform partnership is the word the BCDP, um, uh, and and so obviously that is policy action is there uh, to make that happen together with a suite of reforms which are anticipated to help unlock uh, the capital that is going to be required to implement that national adaptation plan. And I, um, our colleague from AIAB already mentioned this in, in that we see this context within the a, a project preparation uh, facility for adaptation investments being part of it, um, a lot of capacity development, uh, but also a monitoring, evaluation, and learning uh, component. So, so that that is a an iterative process going forward. Um, uh, the expectation is that with this kind of uh, overall a policy context, with the institutional arrangements in place, uh, we believe that it can contribute to to that increased in adaptation investment. Um, in parallel, uh, uh, our team started about uh, 18 months ago doing a lot more work on converting adaptation plans into investment plans. So, so in the context of Bangladesh, we have detailed work going on uh, with the agriculture, resor natural resource components of the, of the NAP uh, with ministries of agriculture, ministries of finance, planning, and climate agencies to help convert that into an investment pipeline. And so, so we see that as an investment pipeline that is not just for uh, Bangladesh, it's also a, a pipeline for other MDBs and, and particularly for ADB. We see that as helping us shift our pipeline for, for achieving our 100 billion uh, that we have set out at ADB. Um, we have uh, a technical assistance uh, uh, grant financing that will support Bangladesh with uh, the platform, uh, capacity development, institutional arrangements, and, and the other uh, needs that will be needed to take that forward. So thanks, Joshua. Happy to take other questions later. Thank you very much, Noel. So we discussed in the first panel um, the question of the design, you know, of the investment program for, for mitigation. And um, I think it's very interesting to note, you know, the work that uh, the African Development Bank uh, is doing, um, in particular, I would say, on the adaptation front, given, you know, the challenges that many African countries confront, you know, in this area. So it would be very interesting uh, to uh, hear from uh, you, uh, Alamdu, how is you know the African Development Bank approaching this issue in terms of formulation of investment requirements for adaptation in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, as a way of introduction, let me first say that um, the country level is the right level of climate action, and uh, I think we have chosen the right uh, uh, action level when focusing on countries. Um, I'm saying that because as MDBs, we already work at country level. We co-finance projects together, but um, we know that certainly we need to do more on various sectors when it comes to addressing climate change. And when we look at African countries, and we have already, you know, we did some <laughs> analytics on the NDCs in Africa, what we realize is that 20% of the commitments African countries made are unconditional, meaning they are going to implement them with their own resources. But the large part of the commitments, about 80%, have to be supported through, you know, mobilizing external resources and support. So, and most of the actions that are, un that are conditional are on adaptation. So, and adaptation being the priority of African countries when it comes to addressing climate change. So let me give you uh, maybe three examples of investment programs we have just uh, started recently in, uh, in Africa. Uh, like uh, EBRD, last year we have supported also Egypt uh, to conceptualize and develop their 
their program, the Nuafi program, the nexus between water, food, and energy program. We have committed 1.3 billion for the water sector. Actually, we took the lead on the water sector. And not it's not just water, but water linked to energy, you know. Actually, our support is to invest more on, you know, water desalination using renewable energy. So we have chosen that particular angle. And uh, we also know that last year when countries have, some countries have engaged in the jet peas, South Africa, one of our key member countries has also approached us and we are also supporting South Africa on the jet peas. That's largely mitigation. Now on adaptation, we have two key initiatives. The Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, a program that we launched two years ago together with the Global Center on Adaptation. It's a 25 billion program. Half of it is being provided by the bank. The rest is to be mobilized through partnerships. And uh, we have um, put in place a mechanism whereby there is an upstream facility that helps provide prepare projects, make them ready for investment. And there is a downstream facility that helps support the implementation of those investment programs. So with the upstream facility, the bank, together with the Global Center on Adaptation, has been able to support already 46 investment projects in 36 countries. So those projects have been prepared. Analytics have been done. They are now ready for, for investment. Now we are coming with our downstream facility. And last year, you may recall that we launched an initiative called the window, which is going to serve as a downstream facility to finance those projects that have been prepared through the upstream facility. So there are already several investment programs there in many countries just waiting for, for support by us through the climate action window. But we are also calling on other partners, especially MDBs, to come and support those remaining programs that are in this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this platform or this uh, framework. It's a framework. And the good thing is that the AAAP, we call it like that, Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, is being now uh, you know, seen as an example that could be replicated in other continents. I know that Asia is interested. And recently, several partners have joined us. We know that we uh, World Bank has also approached us for to join the, the platform, the Agence Française de Développement as well. We also do have UNDP and other uh, development partners ready to, to support that. So it's an innovative, innovative tool. It's a platform that will help strengthen adaptation action at regional level, but most, most, most importantly, at country level. The last example I want to give is a, a new one that we launched recently at the Africa Climate Summit in September this year. We call it Country Adaptation Investment Compacts. Uh, and these are really country-led and country-focused adaptation programs. We have started with uh, seven countries, including Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria, Mozambique, Senegal. They have launched the compacts last, uh, this year in September. And uh, now what we are doing is to work at country level through the, you know, the donor community to bring together development partners, including MDBs, to support those adaptation compacts. These compacts are actually, they have, we started doing analytics first. What is the level of vulnerability at the country level? What are the key vulnerable sectors at country level? And what are the investment opportunities? And what are also the financial mechanisms to support those investment opportunities? And I think, uh, as I speak, we are engaging already countries like uh, in, in, in Kenya, Tanzania, Senegal, and uh, Mozambique. We are already working with partners at country level, including MDBs, to finance those uh, investment programs. And uh, I, I, to conclude, I think that these are examples of, uh, we have just started. We need more to do more. And we cannot do that alone. And being that uh, AFDB and other MDBs are working at country level in those countries, it's a unique opportunity for us to support such uh, country, country platforms. 
one important thing I want to say before I, I give you back the floor is that, you know, it's good we are talking about country sector platforms, but from our experience, we see that this might become country multi-sectoral platform because in one particular program, you, you may find two or three more different sectors. And how do you create the links between those sectors in order to maximize climate impacts? For me, that would be something that we need to, to consider moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alamdou. So we'll have to add uh, S after was, sector. Yeah. <laughs> but I think really the key point here is really to mention that uh, it really is, I would say, the country at the end that has to determine that. Okay. And it goes back into this notion of priority that, you know, the analytics show what the range of issues are. The country, in a way, together with you, together, you know, with other partners decides, you know, how much to tackle up front, right? And in certain cases, maybe it may be two or three because of the interlinkages. In other cases, maybe it may be more sequenced over time, you know, particularly because implementation always needs to be tested, Absolutely. you know, on the ground. So speaking of implementation, let me turn now uh, to Graham, because if we continue to go in our color palette, once we have defined, you know, these investment programs, whether they're in mitigation, adaptation on both multi-sector, single sector, uh, financing comes, uh, you know, into question. Um, I think previous speakers have mentioned obviously public, private mobilization. But um, uh, I understand that uh, the Inter-American Development Bank has been really working on quite a range of, I would say, innovative financing instruments uh, that they're bringing, particularly sometimes to address areas in which uh, I would say the revenue flows may not always be, you know, completely uh, obvious, you know, to figure out but where you seem to be finding solutions that are very uh, interesting. So, Graham, could you share uh, some of these with us? I'll try to, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I wanted to start by saying why the Inter-American Development Bank Group's interested in this agenda. And one of the reasons is that G20 is about to shift from India to Brazil. Uh, so that we're about to get the agenda. Uh, and today we took over the MDBA heads coordination. So that kind of puts us in a, it, right in the firing line, not just of country platforms, but of MD reform in general. I would also, oh, I'd also say that there's actually a lot of action already going on on the ground in Latin America and the Caribbean with respect to country platforms. Uh, that ranges from joint work that we've, done for the last 10, 15 years uh, on the SIFs, the Climate Investment Funds, uh, amongst other programs. Uh, we jointly land with EIB, with AFD, with other groups, KFW, directly uh, in investments in countries where we, they, we actually do projects together directly. Um, and we recently signed agreements with the World Bank, basically looking at climate resilience and disasters in the Caribbean, looking at the Amazon as a major focus area, and also looking at digitalization, which also has implications. But probably most importantly, there are a lot of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean that are already doing country platforms in de facto. And I've got Colombia sitting in front of me as one example, but there are numerous countries that are already doing this. They're already thinking about climate and development, and they're already trying to set up the, the frameworks for action, the long-term strategies, all the way down to the investment plans, even to thinking about costs and benefits of doing this. Uh, amongst them, Costa Rica, Chile, Uruguay, the Dominican Republic, Colombia, um, and Barbados as examples. But So there's a lot of movement already in this direction. I'm going to quickly go through three groups of different uh, types of instruments that we think are highly relevant to the agenda. The first one is basically technical assistance and policy lending. It's a bit of a no-brainer, and I think we've already covered it to some extent. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the CCDRs are super important inputs. Uh, we could work more and more together on those. Uh, we already have, for the, in the case of Peru, the case of Brazil, there was a lot of interaction in terms of developing those. But that kind of knowledge input in general is a strength of the banks in t terms of providing technical assistance to countries so that they can actually have the information and knowledge to be able to take decisions. So that kind of support is crucial. 
but it's even more crucial when you connect that to programmatic policy lending. So not just a one-off policy loan, but a series of policy loans that can help to move uh, people in the right direction. And Sarah had mentioned this as well in terms of what we really need to be thinking about. And if these policy loans can, can be connected back to the long-term strategies that were mentioned at the beginning, then I think that we're starting to get on the right course with respect to that. There are some evolutions in policy lending that we're experimenting with as well. Uh, even though the debt for nature conversions, the guarantees for debt for nature conversions that we've been doing uh, and already announced in Barbados and Ecuador don't look like policy loans, they actually are policy loans in some sense. They're guarantees for policies, basically. So you, you need to develop the policies that are aligned with your broader planning, and then we track whether or not you deliver those policies over time. We're also working with the IMF with the uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust Fund to look at how we can actually move that agenda forward too. There, in this case, the IMF is providing the financing, but we actually do the technical assistance work to try and move the agenda forward. And much of that agenda is actually around how do you create the enabling conditions for private investment uh, in countries. And we've done that in looking at that in Barbados, Costa Rica, and Jamaica so far, and we just began to think about that in Paraguay. Um, so I think this, this concept of building, having the clarity leadership from the country, the country knows what it's trying to do, uh, has that designed in long-term strategies and NDCs, investment plans, and has already understood the costs and benefits of that. That's a base that the, the MDBs can help with. And we have the existing instruments to be able to do that. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, because the next phase of this is the investments themselves. So I, I'm not going to go into all of the different kinds of investments. And again, it's a bit of a no-brainer that you would align your investments to those plans. But one area that we're also going to be talking a lot about at COP, uh, and we have a separate session on it, is something we're calling BitClima, which is basically an effort to support countries with this agenda, but also to reduce costs of capital for these kinds of investments that are aligned with achieving the agenda. So it's, it's actually, we're, we're doing a pilot across 10 countries. Uh, we're going to be talking, we have a session where we'll talk with the countries about the pilot. We'll reduce the cost of capital by about 5% in each of the cases in direct investments. But this is connected to three different kinds of indicators. The first indicator is the standard one where you, you're looking at performance and delivery of results that are in the NDCs. They can be in NBSAPs. They can be in NAPs directly. That's the easiest indicator. The other indicators, one of them is related to governance, to the transversality within government, to making sure ministries of finance are working with ministries of environment and with the sector directly. And the third one we also discussed a little bit earlier is about MRVs, about actually having the capacity to monitor important results. This is an experiment. We're trying to see whether or not it'll work. If it works, it could be large. We're going to allocate a billion of uh, ordinary capital to the agenda to move it forward. And we've already found the funding to be able to support the reduction in the cost of capital and the technical assistance that's going to be required to help countries where they need where they need help to be able to build the capacity. I wanted to come back to a point Jim Pedro also mentioned about, you know, where's adaptation and all of this. And, and not forget that we have traditional historical instruments things that we call contingent credit facilities, for example, that we've had for a very long time. And what we're looking at there is to, how do we enhance those? How do we think about the expansion of those over time? And one of the, we'll have another session with the, the, with the UK on uh, climate and disaster risk clauses in contracts, which are connected directly to the contingent credit facilities from a triggering perspective. So we're also looking at those kinds of questions as well to be able to advance the agenda. And I don't want to take up a huge amount of time because you can also go to all the other sessions on, on all of these issues. But I do think it's important that we, we look at the suite of instruments that we have and move the agenda forward. And in some, I, I, I want to repeat that, that earlier message. We do have the experience of working together. The climate investment funds are an example of where basically we're, MDB should be working together and collaborating in countries. Uh, we have a lot of work already on the ground, at least in Latin America and the Caribbean, where the planning, the structuring, the investment planning, the thinking about costs and benefits is already in place. So really, it's about aligning to that. Uh, and there, I think, yeah, and I want to finish with, with this, 
the IDB group is also restructuring its its whole um, institutional strategy. And in its institutional strategy, it's doing what the World Bank has done, which is incorporate uh, basically global public goods, biodiversity and climate as a direct goal. Once you do that, that's going to filter down into the country strategies, and then the country strategies are going to be aligned to what the country actually wants in those areas. And I think that that's a very important step forward in terms of moving the agenda forward. And I think it's really what the MDB reform group was trying to get at when they talk about country platforms, but they also talk about the triple agenda at the higher level. So I'll, I'll stop there. I, I think there's just a whole lot of information, a lot going on, but uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Graham. So I, th I hope that uh, particularly I'm, I'm thankful, Graham, that you mentioned also the word uh, outcomes and impacts, you know, and, because that's obviously the other part that we haven't really talked about, uh, but uh, I think is also a very important element in this discussion on platforms, because if we put a focus, you know, uh, if the countries and the MDBs put a focus on the specification of the goals and particular targets, you know, you have to look at the other side, you know, of this in terms of, you know, what's actually happened. And I think, I feel at least now not being an, in an MDB that there is an increasing focus, you know, on this uh, verification of outcomes and also of looking actually at the impact and shifting from what the discussion between the MDBs and sometimes their shareholders has been in the past, which was, you know, please put another few billions or please increase, you know, the ratio of climate finance from X to X plus X prime, right? And I think that that hopefully is one also of the intentions, you know, behind this work on country platform is really to change, you know, the nature, you know, the content of the discussion towards actually linking that to the real uh, nature of the issues in the countries and to the real scale of this. Right, uh, because when you do the analytics, when you define an investment program, that's what you're doing. You know, you're kind of you know setting what the scale is, and perhaps just one mini thing, which I hope you mentioned firing line. I think perhaps more is to say that the topic, you know, is uh, on the podium or in, in the limelight, and that uh, to a certain extent, you know, the session that we're having today is to a certain extent. Uh, uh, I would say, development of the work of the MDBs, given, you know, this increased attention, and let's say it also given this increased pressure, you know, uh, to, to, to do more. We have a few minutes for questions. So if there are any uh, questions, we have here our panel, I think, right, ready to answer. Yes, sir. And then we'll hear you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Vincent Anner from the EBRD. Uh, I work a lot with uh, with local banks, and I was wondering, in the context of the country platform you mentioned in Bangladesh or in Africa, uh, what's your view on the role of local banks? Have they shown an, an interest in participating in this platform? Do you have any view in terms of where you see the role of these these local banks? It'd be quite interesting to hear your view. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Audrey Cynthia from the African Development Bank Group. I have actually two questions. The first one is, uh, uh, we, we really understand the importance of this country sector platforms, definitely. Uh, what are we going to do uh, on the regional, as a regional platform, because there are common issues, especially on climate change work concerning multiple countries. Um, and how do we how do we work on cross border integration uh, as subjects, especially in, on on climate? So so we need as well those kind of cross bordering pipelines and and information, especially for for region. So this is my first point. The second is about uh, the fundings. Uh, it's always the the elephant in the room. Uh, because uh, I think in terms of how is it structured and the thematic cover is really, really uh, important and, and, and deep. Uh, but the, the level also of resources which will be needed to, to do this work is quite uh, important. So the question, how are we going to mobilize the resources, the adequate resources, especially in this context where we have also uh, many other initiatives and, and topics to, to cover. Thank you very much. 
Any other question? Okay, so I will not allocate, but I will leave your individual enthusiasm to, would you like to say something? Let me start with the question on local banks. Actually, I thought my colleague Audrey was going to respond to that question because currently she's leading an initiative at the African Development Bank called African Green Banks Initiatives. And the objective of the initiative is actually to support local banks to develop their own investment strategies and invest, identif identify a pipeline of green projects in which they could invest or mobilize resources to invest in. So we have already started with a few countries. I think Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco, and Egypt. Those, these are local banks in those countries. So it's, um, in Benin, I think it's a case de dépôt et de consignation. And uh, an investment bank of Cote d'Ivoire is also uh, involved in that program. So work with, uh, we are working with them already. But of course, I think it's just a beginning. It's something we want to scale up. So this uh, initiative is going to grow uh, in the future. And again, I believe this is another area where MDBs could work together depending on the country priorities, priorities of the local banks themselves, and our own priorities, of course. Thank you, Lambda. Graham, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, I'll try and answer all three questions at the same time. On the local banks question, we're actually, we just announced the creation of a green coalition of banks for the Amazon. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> and so we're trying to bring in the national development banks and other banks into the same framework of action uh, within countries. Regional approaches, absolutely, hence the Amazon. But the Amazon is not the only one that we're doing regionally because we've got shared issues. But Central America for resilience and agriculture, we're also working closely with Costa Rica, who are leading a program to move that agenda forward for Central America. Uh, and we're also working, going to announce at COP uh, a, a, an approach for the Caribbean as well, which, again, you have shared problems, shared challenges, very similar challenges in each of those countries. So therefore, you need to try and address the challenges regionally. Um, on the resource availability question, yes, just like everybody else, we're looking at mobilization. We're looking at the questions of private sector engagement to advance the agenda. The One of the if we look again at the response to MDB reform, we're, we're going to try and get a capital increase for our private sector arm. Uh, the base of that capital increase is actually originate to share. So it's actually not about focusing on how much we invest, but it's about creating enabling circumstances so that we can bring in and crowd in private capital into our own investments, where we do a lot of the, the structuring work, move the agenda forward. So. I think that's another issue, but the same as other banks, we're also working on the, the question of capital adequacy to be able to draw in more capital ourselves. We've estimated that we can probably bring in 2 billion on top of the 15 billion that we do every year just from capital adequacy changes, reform changes. And just like ADB and other banks, we're looking at the question of guarantees. So tertiary guarantees that can also then bring in additional financing uh, in our long-term financial planning, we've thought about whether or not we can increase from 15 billion to 20 billion as, as a starting point to move the agenda forward. And I think if you look at the MDB reform thing, it also talks about uh, capital increases, not just for the private sector, but the public sector as well. So different mechanisms to try and draw in more capital as we move forward, not forgetting that we also still need to have that base of concessional finance to drive transformation as well. So. Thank you. Noel, would you like to add anything? Um, just on, from the regional side for ADB, I'm uh, just three regional entities alone. The Central Asia CARIC uh, is one of the, the regional entities, and then obviously the Greater Mekong subregion, which has been active, and then within the ASEAN context itself. So I think there's a number of platforms for operations there. I mean, from in terms of the funding perspective, just a, a couple of areas. Obviously, one is that what I talked about, the investment planning, that shifting the pipeline is obviously critical for us that allows us to direct that greater portion of ADB's own investments into a climate finance, uh, a legitimate climate finance. So, so that's critical for us on upstream engagement across the entire uh, ADB portfolio. Um, just following on from, from, we've already completed the capital adequacy increase 
Uh, that adds for ADB almost 10 billion per annum lending that would take our portfolio from the range of 24 billion to 33 to 35 billion. So very substantial that we shift that pipeline so we can make sure that that increased lending is in the climate area. Um, we have already proceeded establishing the IFCAP fund. So, 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 so those, those are areas for us on, on that incre increased funding. And, and then I think the, the other dimension is on the, obviously the MDBs working together. So, so that, that pipeline of MDB investment, uh, future policy investments are starting to, to reiterate that. The other aspect we're doing more work on in the adaptation space is on uh, climate resilient fiscal planning, where we have initiatives with Indonesia, Mongolia, and and, and Armenia already, um, and that's that's uh, helping uh, work with the ministries of finance direct, obviously, and and that would also uh, have a link with uh, domestic resource mobilization, um, and and we're working now with the Council of Finance Ministers. Uh, I, uh, so that they that agenda shifts also not just from the mitigation space to the adaptation space and and there's event I think to uh, the fifth or the sixth looking at that at that here uh, with the Council of Finance Ministers. So those are a couple of areas, Joshua. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I think from these uh, answers, you can see that you know a lot of the work and a lot of the background you know to the topic that we're discussing is actually very much embedded in this MDB reform work. Uh, your question was particularly on, on capital and resources. Clearly, that's one element, right? Uh, I think Graham mentioned the element of concessional, that to a certain extent that is going to be also very important for certain types you know, of issues. And it's clear that the funding, the funding structure of each of the platforms will, prob you know, will certainly change depending on country, and type of you know activity that it is trying you know uh, to 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 deal with, um, and uh, I think for those of you who are interested in these macro uh, financial issues, I think it's on the fourth of uh, December. There is going to be the launch at noon, I think, of the second volume of the Finance for Climate Action report, and that actually goes really into the micro numbers, uh, so get used to trillions and hundreds of billions, right? But it's useful in the sense that it does give a big frame within which you can see, you know, the expanded role of the MDBs, right? So it does provide, I would say, a, a roadmap with numbers, you know, that that uh, that is relevant. So I think with this, uh, I can turn to first say thank you to our panelists on panel two. Thank you very much. And also, to those on panel one also, not to be uh, forgotten. I hope that this session did provide you with at least some element and some description of each of the colors on that uh, palette that were uh, described. And again, for those of you who may become hooked uh, on this topic, there is going to be a second event on this topic, so-called high-level event, which will include, I think, the presidents of the AIIP and the uh, EBRD on the 3rd of December at uh, 6.30. So with that, thank you very much and uh, have a good continuation of your day at COP28. Thank you.